Welcome back to Radically Rethinking Railways with your host, as always, the Mad Professor. This episode will take us across time and space as we examine why Australia doesn't have mainline electrification generally, but probably should have. This is, in your Mad Professor's opinion, a slam dunk. If we accept Australia is not a special place, and in fact, has very mediocre results for such a promising country. Lesser countries, from Sweden to South Africa, have done more with electrification than we ever did. The time machine has taken us back to 1930s France, where we start our look at what might have been and why it never was. First, let's recap our previous episodes and see how they will fit into today's story. If you've missed these episodes, look out for the links below. Our first episode, The Luckiest Line, looked at an electrified railway through the Nilambic lands of the Wurundjeri people to Hurstbridge. We saw that electrification might have saved this line from its likely demise in 1969. In our second episode, Why Are We Here? We looked at the purpose of this channel, and that is to destroy false narratives that have grown up around railways in Australia. Some are pernicious, like the one that says that Australian railways can't have, or don't deserve, electrification. Our third episode looked at a line to Healesville that wasn't as lucky as the luckiest line, even though it went through similar Wurundjeri country. Electric carriages worked as locomotives and dragged country carriages to the end of the wire at Lilydale for a steam loco to take over. In 1969, it was identified for closure, and in 1980, it was closed. Though your mad professor has since ridden trains on it for its whole length, enabled by the sums of money that were spent on a closed line, money that could have been spent when it was open, perhaps to include electrification. The fourth episode looked at how Australian railways are the victim of poor public policy development, instead of coming up with plans for things like electrification, based on vision, policy and evidence, we tend to muddle through. In our fifth episode, we took up the fight against the false narrative of population size and density as being a limit on Australian railways, and we will come back to that one today in looking at why the decision to electrify may have literally nothing to do with population or density. In episode six, we asked ourselves, what's in the name? We wondered why, if the ancient Chinese could get the names right, why modern bureaucrats are so sloppy with the way they think about trains and railways, and how this lack of precision could cause real fights and fake ones over the names. The focus on so-called trams will be important to today's story as we ponder the question, why did just about every street railway in Australia get electrified, but almost all the others did not? We then looked across at the railways of the Noongar lands at Perth, which were saved in the 1980s, then electrified, which turned around their ridership by an order of magnitude. The Perth people defeated the false narratives they get told about rail, and instead got on and built a worthwhile network, one still being built to this day. And in our last episode, we tackled the false narrative that railways in Australia have only declined because of the covert actions of a malevolent road lobby, rather than because of what the railways did to themselves. You can blame the road lobby for the lack of funds to electrify Australia's railways, but you'd be wrong. They didn't get much more funding either. You can see, in all our previous episodes, the question of why we didn't electrify our mainline railways is partly answered, but there is more to it than even that. Let's dive in. Let's get out of the way first that we are talking about the mainline railways, significant railways beyond the suburban areas of the major cities. Sydney and Melbourne both had suburban electrification in the 1920s, and as we said earlier, all the major street railway networks had them, and that was most of the cities in Australia above a certain size. They had wired their networks. But apart from a couple of niche private lines, this was not a feature of railways in Australia until the 1950s. Of course, the word suburban in the 1920s had a vastly different meaning to its current one, a meaning which is more congruent with the one used overseas. It meant something similar to satellite city, the way Whitlam would have used it. In 1920, stations like Lilydale 
Liverpool, Hornsby or Frankston were places a long way from town, with bushland in between. All of these had long stretches of double track and freight trains, so by some people's reasoning they might have been termed main line. But we mean those projects that are much longer and would have had freight and intercity passenger rail as their primary customers, while Victorian railways built a small fleet of electric locomotives for local goods and shunting. In truth, neither railway had anything like mainline electrification. And it's not that they didn't look at doing it. Your mad professor, as always, loves digging up the old files and has copied the master file for mainline electrification in New South Wales. With its genesis in the 1920s, the work was done in the 1930s to examine, at a minimum, electrifying to Lithgow, Newcastle, Nowra and Goulburn from Sydney. While this would still only be a small fraction of the total network length in New South Wales, it would have been the bulk of the traffic, and especially a large share of the crewing and tonnage. We talked about how some of the most harebrained policy failures in Australian rail, like closing the street railways, came to us from the UK. So I guess it is no surprise that with the UK largely absent from mainline electrification in those days, that we didn't attack it with any gusto either. The leaders in those days were places like Italy or France. The US had started on its two separate schemes, being the New York to Washington and New York to New Haven corridors, but remained largely a steam, then diesel railroad. The New South Wales scheme from the 1930s has the vibe of being based on a French idea, something like the Paris Le Mans section of the Chemin de Fer de l'État. The French got off to a good start with mainline electrification, recognising the reduced labour required, how much cleaner it was, the greater power and speed of electric locomotives, and how much less maintenance and servicing these engines required. And this was even with the low voltage direct current systems they were using. This episode is not going to go into the differences between high voltage alternating current and low voltage direct current railways, except to note how these differences can impact on cost. It should have been a glorious time for the French railways, coming to the end of the decade with more lines being wired, but it wasn't. The French railways were mercilessly attacked, first by Germans trying to force the surrender on the French, then by the French resistance, trying to make it impossible for the occupiers to supply their troops then by the Allies, also trying to prevent German resupply, and finally by the Germans again, as France slipped from their grasp. We see this in the famous Bataille du Rail, or the Battle of the Rails. By 1945, much of the French rail network, like those across Europe and Asia, was in ruins. But unlike in Australia, this was quickly restored. In a future episode, we will look at the false narrative that Australian railways were hampered by the Great Depression and World War II. We should have had it easy compared with the French. But by 1950, the French railways were back on their feet and progressing fast. Main line to Lyon on Marseille was wired and began to set records. With two different locomotives from two different makers, both exceeding 300 kilometres an hour. The locos and wiring were in pretty average shape after that record, but the point was proven. They then switched to high voltage AC. The precision engineering, including alignment of the line, would open a new age of high speed rail. Within 10 years, the Japanese were proving it too in daily use. Another country whose rail system was shattered by the war, but got on and fixed it and made it better, unlike a certain land down under. But what hope for Australia? Our fortunes were tied to the old colonial master, but they were in a bad way. Unlike mainland Europe or Japan, little had been done beyond the basics to repair the war damage, let alone make improvements. Rather than push into the brave new world of electric or even diesel power, Britain pushed on with steam, 
and apparently expected Australia to keep on with steam. These locomotives of the R and J classes were actually delivered after the first classes of diesels. But sticking to the topic of mainline electrification, we did see some early British third rail low voltage schemes to Brighton and Portsmouth from London. But the first real toe in the water was the main line from Manchester to Sheffield. This line has since closed, sadly. However, it set the template for two schemes in Australia. Being low voltage DC, it was not really the role model we needed. That would have been the French, Italians or even the Swedes, but not Britain. Australia had a coal boom after the war. It meant that the powers that be thought it was time to electrify. Coal traffic was up, but also the cost of coal and of steam locomotives and their crews. It meant that an alternative was needed. Two routes in New South Wales were chosen. To Wing, west of the Blue Mountains from Parramatta. To Newcastle from Hornsby. In Victoria, the route to the Latrobe Valley with its brown coal, which was converted industrially into a combustible fuel called briquettes, was extended from Dandenong. These schemes were limited, and in Victoria, in any event, also short-lived. While they were needed when proposed in 1946, it was not until the late 1950s they were delivered in New South Wales and the mid-1950s in Victoria. By that time, the booms they were needed for were all but over. It wasn't just about pricing, but also about the way people consumed energy. Far more people after the war were no longer using solid fuels in their houses, and factories were increasingly were either using gas or electricity being generated by the state power authority. Shipping coal into the city was just not as important as it once was. It was far from the end of coal, but the glory days of coal traffic in New South Wales and Victoria were rapidly departing. It was hoped that these electric lines would also be used for general traffic, but this too faced a decline in the number of trains. By the late 1950s, dieselisation of what traffic remained might have been another choice, but of course, like everything Australia needed, it was decades late. In railway terms, we were muddling through, just like the Colonial Masters were. Their schemes, like Woodhead and later the West Coast Main Line and East Coast Main Line, were patchy, stop-start, and more often stopped than started. Don't take your mad professor's word for it. Let's listen to John Stevens of the Federal Trust, talking about Britain's failed exit from the EU. We can somehow make the thing work. We can muddle all through. And this is, uh, I'm afraid, um, a, a line of thinking that has a very long and not very glorious history in, in British policymaking. You can see which country gave us the idea of muddling through on railways. The Victorian scheme was abandoned in the mid-1980s, beyond the suburban limit of Pakenham. And the line settled back to having barely one freight train a day, and no coal was being moved by rail. In New South Wales, the projects were both nobbled by government, with the help of the American consulting firm Abasco Services. They wrote a report calling for the Wollerowang electrification to be cancelled west of the Lithgow suburb of Bowenfeld, and the Newcastle electrification to be stopped at Gosford. Passengers were, and are, a different story. While freight was patchy, and eventually no longer used electric power, the passenger services on the wired section have only grown. The decision by New South Wales to develop multiple unit passenger trains, rather than loco haul, definitely sealed the deal. That's why, unlike in Victoria, the electric wires are still in use for Lithgow and Gosford. Even the British, once they got over their post-war malaise, muddled themselves into electrifying their main lines using high voltage AC. But the decision to use the British approach definitely cost us in extra time and cost to deliver, and provided an inferior product overall. Australia was starting to get some impetus towards electrifying again, with coal once again pushing us along, particularly in Queensland. After the decision was made to electrify the Brisbane suburban network using high voltage AC on a platform of Japanese and Swedish technology, it was then extended to electrifying the main sections of the coal network, and it was the right call. Much of the Bowen Basin rail system and its mines grew from nothing after the war into a major rail network, using the existing line to Blackwater and a new line to Gunyella. 
and their associated branch line. So the Fitzgerald inquiry said that Joe Bielsen Peterson paid too much for the scheme and gave some of it to friends of his, nonetheless. Today, no one remembers the cost or gives a damn about any of that. His system was a huge success and is still in use to this day. The last extension to it, to Bauhinia Mine, was about 10 years ago. And it gives us a glimpse into how mainline electrification could be delivered and costed in contemporary dollars. On the back of the coalfields electrification, Queensland they've also electrified the main line from Gladstone to Outer Brisbane. And a short segment to Emerald in central Queensland from the junction of the last mine at Tolmy. We have not been quite so fortunate with these schemes. Thankfully, the main line section is still in use, but only by a few passenger trains a day. The electric locos that were bought for this line were sent off to the mine and replaced with diesels. And why that was hints at a larger problem, which we will discuss today. The emerald section was a bit less fortunate, having been removed from the last coal mine. Though again, this is a great point for discussion and may yet be put back if the coal mines further west require it. The QR scheme set so many good new standards. A new multiple unit long distance electric train to Rockhampton and its successor, our first medium speed tilting train. And the locos, which were pretty as a picture in their mainline days. Viewers interested in Perth electrification should go see episode seven, where the wildflowers grow. And in a later episode, we will cover the future of the line to Bunbury. But where did we go wrong? It was not for want of trying. The technical problems with our electrification schemes serious as they were, were never a good reason to not work harder to make them better or persevere if we needed to. Some of the world's most significant rail electrification schemes have some of the same limitations we do, or worse. Southeastern England is mostly low voltage third rail electrification. An interior system with lower overall top speed is subject to safety and weather problems but it still moves large numbers of people daily across quite long distances. A journey from Weymouth to Ramsgate. At both ends of the third rail network would be more than 300 kilometres. The Netherlands has built a large network of low voltage DC overhead electrification to the Sydney or Melbourne standards. And this runs successfully and economically, including with routes shared by high speed trains. And while we can see the electric railways in Australia have got themselves into some problems, so bad those problems were, it seems, the lines to Tarelgan and Emerald had the wire taken down. But it looks to your mad professor, the problem was not so much the wiring, but not enough wiring. The coal scheme to Tarelgan was not particularly successful, but this is not the reason the line was dewired. Instead, it was because the Victorian government had not constructed some electric multiple unit passenger trains for the line. We know this because New South Wales continues to use electric traction for passengers even in locales like Lithgow or Kayama, a long way from Sydney. And in the case of Kayama, it has never been used for electric freight. When they decommissioned the original Tarelgan electric locomotives, they were hauling standard passenger cars. So all they did was swap to diesels, also hauling these cars. In fact, your mad professor was on the last electric train from Tarelgan. They did dally for a while, with a suburban set running as far as Warrigal but with no enthusiasm for it, and it was too long for a train with poor seating and no toilets. While your mad professor would have loved to see a broad gauge version of a New South Wales multiple unit train, such as based on the V-Set or the Tangara on this line, even a basic Cummings train with upgraded interior, like this former Harris train, would have done. Of course the line was due for a midlife overhaul as well, but this was nothing less than the New South Wales system also got as well as a Melbourne suburban network. Quite feasible if the political will had been there. And these days, Tarelgan gets multiple unit trains, only this time diesels. Let's go back to the start. Then where the failure of the New South Wales schemes from before the war is nothing to do with raw economics, nor any technical problems. The technology they proposed was not too different from what we ended up with in the 1950s. As we said, we could have done better, but what we have is good enough for us and for the Netherlands today. The economics should have also been a slam dunk. 
to get a contemporary coal train of a thousand tons from the western side of the Blue Mountains to the east might have been three or four standard goods locomotives and a guard travelling in his van. In other words, a crew of nine people on each train. The coal consumed by this train would itself have been considerable, and let's not forget just how much shed labour keeping this train running would take. And you can imagine the volumes of coal needing to be lifted, and the wheat, and general goods, and even passengers, which today are quite significant. Of course, we're talking as if the NSWGR wanted to run the most efficient trains possible. But that might be wishful thinking. Your mad professor has read media reports from the time. There is no sense that they would increase the tonnage, train length, or any other factor with the Lifco electrification. And that might be one of the reasons the scheme has struggled. Had the 1930s scheme gone ahead, it would have made sense to electrify every line south of Musselbrook to Cessnock on the private network, around Newcastle, west to Lithgow or Bathurst, up the Mudgee line to at least Candos, down the Melbourne line to at least Goulburn, and the south coast to Nowra. If every line in this area had been wired, it would have covered most of the passenger traffic and much of the freight of the entire New South Wales network. In the 1970s, during the oil crisis, Philip Shirley as boss proposed expanding the electrification again, this time to Newcastle, Port Kembla and Goulburn. But the jury was definitely in, and the high voltage AC system, then about to be used in Queensland, would have been the best course. Goulburn never got done, and there were fundamental weaknesses in the 86 class locomotives they bought. But how is that really relevant? It would not be the first time a locomotive purchase has not gone well. Enthusiasts can rattle off the steam and diesel purchases with short lives, like the 58 class steamers or the 40 class diesels. An entire diesel class scrapped before the last of the 19 class steam locos already 100 years old. If the railways can be forgiven for a steam or diesel design that did not deliver, surely all you would do is try again and do better next time. We know the Queenslanders did better, but like New South Wales, their scheme has been undermined not by anything technical or economics, but politics and ideology. Electrification only works at its best when two things are done. The first is that an electrified line should include as much of the actual route that the trains use, so that few, if any, trains require a loco change at the end of the wire. At both the Rockhampton and Emerald ends of the Queensland Mainline project, most trains had to travel onwards, towards Townsville and Cairns, or towards Longreach or the branch lines of the Central West. Unless these routes were also electrified, you would automatically be disadvantaging the railway with those locomotive changes. The Emerald Line was a sad story. It terminated short of the branch lines to Claremont and Blair Athol, and might have hauled more coal and wheat that way. Or the branch to Springshaw, but why not all the way to Longreach? It's not like they didn't also spend money on the Drummond Range beyond Emerald. That cost money too, and getting good value from that work should have meant longer, more powerful trains, like those with electrics. Even a multiple unit tourist train could have worked, like the one we had to Rockhampton. The second thing needed to make electrification work is getting the political and ideological framework right. Australia absorbed a huge dose of neoliberal ideology in the 1980s and 90s, which led railway managements to believe in spurious ideas, things like competition, privatisation, vertical and horizontal separation. These things were quackery if you don't get the fundamentals right. And all these things were fatal to electrification at least as it was structured here. We will talk about these ills more in a future episode, but suffice to say, they were ills in the same way a patient dying of an incurable illness might try quack medicine. These things were quackery, if you don't get the fundamentals right. We are back in Sweden to look at what they did right. Contrary to what you might think, they also did have a measure of competition, privatisation and separation, but the railway there was already almost fully electrified when they did. Each operator had to use electric trains, and with Sweden's strong commitment to decarbonising the economy, they have to. Sweden's power is a mix of nuclear and hydro, so every kilowatt hour is a fill of diesel fuel not used. Whatever the reason, you should see the returns that come from those better services. Here in Sweden, it isn't just the populated south and coastal strip that has been electrified. 
an entire new line has been built across the forests and subarctic terrain to Umeå, a smallish city a long way from Stockholm. And the line was built for 250 km an hour top speed. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. The line will be extended even further towards the Arctic wilderness and the city of Luleå. All these lines you probably know, the Malmbana to Narvik in Norway, the main lines to Gothenburg in Copenhagen, even smaller lines like this one to Kalmar, where your mad professor's ancestors came from, all electric. And look at the Swedish wilderness, so few people, but so much electric wire. This all runs on a mix of nuclear, hydro and renewables, and it was wired very early. Maybe the relative cost of energy has something to do with it. Let's investigate. Your mad professor cannot access the true prices paid for electricity by industrial users. But let's look at the retail prices of electricity in Sweden and Australia, adjusted for purchasing power parity. Lo and behold, according to the OECD, they are exactly the same. Australia was sandwiched in between Sweden and Finland in retail prices. And if the opponents of electrification were going to argue that as a factor, they fail. But they will say, diesel fuel is considerably more expensive in Sweden than Australia. But then, that is mostly the product of the taxation of fuel, which is deliberately high in Sweden, a choice the government deliberately made, to aid the environment. And you can see it helps that Sweden has electric railways as a choice. In Australia, the choice is being made to keep diesel fuel relatively cheap, but then we suffer from an unfavourable attitude towards electric rail. There are also more radical Swedish policies to screw aviation in favour of rail, but we won't look at them today. To wrap up though, it is all about the choices governments make. And where did we go wrong? Through the years, we had reports suggesting electrification could take place from Sydney to Melbourne, from Perth to Bunbury, north from Rockhampton to Townsville, the Hunter lines to Musselbrook or beyond, a promise to finally electrify to Nowra. All of these would have given us a significant extra length of wire and a smaller diesel bill. Had we done all these, the politics of grief, of factions complaining about the cost, would have been long forgotten. And where do we stand today? Hybrid technologies are creating even more possibilities. The barrier to wiring the Nowra line has always been the pretty section at Amiga, with its many tunnels. But that short length could be overcome by a battery electric train running on the battery through the tunnels. It might need a much shorter length of wire on the main line, just as long as it takes to recharge. Perhaps such a train could make it from Kayama to Nowra just on the battery and recharge at the Bombardieri platform. Either way, it reduces the cost and expands the possibilities. Or we could try hydrogen, like they have here in Sweden. But even without these technologies, we should still pursue mainline electrification. From Musselbrook to Bunbury, we are seeing the never-ending growth in population and traffic congestion, the need for a zero-carbon future, and a continuing need for rail efficiency. If we can get those costs down to a million a kilometre, like they did at Bauhinia, it should be money well spent. So as we are leaving Stockholm, who do we see at the Tunnel Barna station? Than the world's richest busker, Jörn Ulvaeus from ABBA. We should throw him a kroner. If you manage a railway, you'll remember his immortal wisdom from 1976. All the things I could do if I had a little money. In our next episode, we will keep slogging away at those false narratives. Do Australian railways actually have a lack of money? What is money anyway? And if money isn't the problem, what is? Next time, in Money, Money, Money. See you then.